Good morning to everyone who's here. Uh, good morning to those who are watching online as well, uh, either live or on the rerun as well. Uh, my name is Edric. I'm one of the lay speakers here. Um, just as we start, I wanted to ask, you know, what would be your favorite type of film or show to watch? You know, action movies? You know, hands up. How many of you like action movies? Thrillers? Romantic comedies? <laughs> Documentaries? I've been told to ask, add this from the first service, K-dramas. <laughs> You know, are these the kind of shows that you can watch over and over again? You know, one of my personal favorite kind of movie to watch is a, you know, a good heist movie, like uh, is Inception or Ocean's Eleven, where you see like a carefully laid out plan is put in place and, you know, being carried out badly or poorly as it, as it happens to be. But what I find most interesting about these movies is that I like to rewatch them, you know, especially after you know the ending, so that you can try and pick up all the detail, the foreshadowing. It actually becomes more interesting to watch it a second time through. Now, as we continue in our story of Matthew's Gospel and along the Passion narrative, and it's appropriate we're doing this now because we are now in, you know, in, the, in the time of Lent leading up to Easter as well, we should have that same excitement of going through this story more and more. So much of the details that are actually there in the gospel narrative is actually missed on the first reading. But it's sad that often, due to familiarity, we do not pause and slow down and look at the details. Our familiarity sometimes also reduces how impressive or shocking these events are. But today I want to take you through the passage to help you rediscover the awe and the wonder of it. But to help us do that, we need to go back to the Old Testament first. Matthew is often called the Jewish Gospel because it focuses on the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy and that his original readers were Jewish believers. The original Jewish audience would have had no problems with what often most of us would struggle with, seeing the parallels between the events of Passion Week and Passover. Now, Passover was significant for Israel. The original events are recorded in Exodus 11 and 12, and it marks their departure from Egypt, from slavery to freedom. It was so significant that the entire calendar was reworked around it. It is the last of the ten plagues, also called the plague of the firstborn, where God comes to Egypt to strike down all the firstborn, except where a perfect lamb was sacrificed and the blood painted over the door, so that God will see the blood and pass over the house. And the Jews were commanded to commemorate Passover, and they continue to do so even to this day. What we now know, that the Israelites then didn't, is that the event of the Exodus wasn't the end all and be all, that actually it was merely a signpost, it was merely pointing forward to the events here in Passion Week that we are reading where the Passover lamb of God will be sacrificed so that God's people can be liberated from the slavery of sin and death and have freedom to life and life to the full. Now, the events of the Last Supper in chapter 26 occur on the actual Passover meal that all the Jews would have been celebrating. The words Jesus used to institute the ritual of communion is actually based and modified from the original words used to mark the Passover by the Jews. The arrest trial of Jesus and, the, and his death will also mirror the sacrifice of the original Passover in Exodus and the commemoration that would have been occurring at the temple on the actual day Jesus died. Just as a reminder, we have seen in the previous chapter, chapter 26, the arrest of Jesus after the Last Supper. Jesus is then brought to the Jewish leaders and tried by them, and he was condemned for blasphemy for claiming to be the Son of God. And they declare in verse 66 that he was worthy of death. Then in the narrative, there is a brief interlude in the narrative to deal with Peter and Judas, as Pastor Parno was speaking about last week. And now we resume the story about Jesus. Now let's read the passage together before we unpack it. So if you have your Bibles, just open it to Matthew 27, and I'll start reading from 
verse 11 through to 26. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me pray as we start to unpack this passage. Our Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for being able to gather here as your people to study your word. Help us to not be over familiar with this story about Jesus on trial before Pilate, but help us to really, you know, look in at the detail and recapture the awe and the wonder of what actually happened here. Pray that you would speak to us through your word, that we would learn to love you more through it, and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we start the narrative, we see that Jesus has been brought to the Roman authorities. He has to be brought to the Roman authorities here because the death penalty could only be given by the Romans, because the Jews were conquered people. However, the Romans would not use the death sentence to resolve a religious issue. So, Jesus being claiming to be the Son of God, that's nothing to do, that's not nothing major as far as the Romans were concerned. So, in verse 11, we see here that the Jews must have told told Pilate something different. They changed their story and claimed that Jesus wanted to be a king. And that is, you know, to be king instead of Caesar. And that is treason, and it's punishable by death. Now, the person in the hot seat who had to decide the case is Pilate, the Roman governor. Though this section is often labeled as Jesus before Pilate or the trial before Pilate, as we will see, it's not really about Jesus and Pilate, but we do need to look at him briefly to understand the context. Now, there are many caricatures about Pilate. Undoubtedly, if he existed... Uh, Now, there will be all sorts of memes about him being weak-willed, you know, pushover, constantly washing his hands. There also isn't much about him in the histories. But the records do show that he was the governor of Judea for 10 years. That's 10 years in charge of an incredibly restive province. It speaks to his ability to handle pressure. When we look at our passage here, we see an astute individual. Somebody who, you know, being thrown out of bed at a crack of dawn, had a mob shouting all sorts of things in front of him, could actually discern the real motivation of the Jewish leaders in verse 18, that it was out of envy. And he also determined correctly that Jesus was innocent, declared in verse 23, what evil has this man done? Now, if Pilate had to gain politically from it, history tells us he had no problem seriously upsetting or antagonizing the Jewish people. And he had done so. Yet here, when an innocent man's life is at stake versus possible problems for him, if he let him go in the form of a riot, Pilate chooses famously to literally wash his hands of the matter and take the easy way out. Now, keep your finger in Matthew 27, but you know, go forward to Acts chapter 4, looking at verse 27. Now, 
Despite Pilate wanting to wash his hands on the matter, he is rightly condemned for being in conspiracy with the Jews, as was pronounced by Peter and John here in Acts. For truly in this city they were gathered together and against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel. So Pilate is lumped in with all the other leaders and the Gentiles and the Jewish people as all being responsible for the death of Jesus. And this was already prophesied in Psalm 2, which is quoted in the preceding verses in Act 4. But look at verse 28. It also, the apostles also recognized that this was planned and predestined by God. It shows you God's power. Someone is powerful when he can do what he wants. But how powerful is God that he can get his enemies to do what he wants? Pilate didn't realize that was the case. That he had, his pass, he had his part in the great Passover sacrifice of God. So let's go back to Matthew 27. Let's just continue seeing what God has planned. But before we see the main event, let's take a look at the two main characters of this drama. So the first up is Jesus. But to help us, let's look at the Passover lamb. As per the instructions in Exodus, it had to be without blemish and perfect. The outward requirement of physical perfection of the lamb was to be an image of the required inner perfection or innocence. Now hold that thought and look down to your Bibles at verse 12 and 14. In the face of all the charges, Jesus gives no answer. Pilate was greatly amazed. Pilate, who would have seen his fair share of people who on his judgment could be put to death, he would have seen the different types of typical reactions of these people. And yet Jesus' reaction to facing the death penalty was startling to him. It was not ordinary. This will be one of the defining characteristics of Christians down the ages, of how they react in the face of death. Four Christians who were being thrown to the lions in the Colosseum in the, day, in the early days of the church. To the recorded death of Dietrich Bonhoeffer during the Second World War for resisting the Nazi regime or to a friend's father who was diagnosed and ultimately died from lung cancer. The reaction of the followers of Jesus in the face of death are out of the ordinary, and it always provokes people to ask, why is it so different? This is also only, the only gospel to record the warning that Pilate receives from his wife in verse 19. It makes you wonder how much of a dream and how much suffering she went through that she would go through the hassle of making sure Pilate got her message when he was on the judge's bench. Yet this was another sign to Pilate to convince him of Jesus' innocence. So Pilate comes to this conclusion that Jesus is innocent. He has done no evil, declared in verse 23. Pilate would unknowingly be paralleling the actions of the priest on the very same day. For in the temple, the priest would have, would have selected a lamb and would have declared the lamb perfect before the sacrifice to commemorate the Passover. Now that we have seen Jesus' innocence, let's turn to the other main character of this story. And this character is oft, often overlooked, for the other main character here is Barabbas. Barabbas, as a name, literally translates to son or father, bringing to mind again the Passover lamb that was sacrificed so that do, death would not fall on the first bound firstborn in the house in Egypt. Matthew's gospel contains a very simple description of him as a notorious prisoner. It chooses not to give any more detail. The word notorious implies that Barabbas' crime and his guilt are well known to the people. He wasn't in prison facing the death sentence by accident. The other gospels make it known that he is in prison for trying to rebel against Roman rule and murder. And then under more modern legal codes, this is known as high treason. In the U and this is trying to overthrow the government. In the UK, which has effectively abolished the death penalty during the 7 July bombings, and I was present there then, there was much debate on securing the death sentence for the, re for the remaining arrested perpetrators with high treason so that they could face the high the death sentence. It reflects the seriousness of any effort to try and overthrow the government, or as it was in Jesus' time, to overthrow Caesar, the king. It's not a coincidence that Jesus is falsely accused of being what Barabbas was actually guilty of, trying to overthrow the Romans, trying to remove Caesar as king. But more than that, in this story, Barabbas represents all of us as well. For all of us are guilty of high treason. 
Because ultimately, sin in its core, in its very nature, is about wanting to overthrow God's rule in our lives. God is the right and true king of our lives, and every time we try and decide for ourselves what's right and wrong, we are trying to remove Him as king. So even in the Garden of Eden, this is what Adam and Eve did. They wanted to decide for themselves what was good and evil and not listen to God. This is why any sin, from the most minor to the most heinous, ultimately carries the death penalty. The wages of sin is death. This is why if you fantasize about someone sexually in your heart or go out and actually sleep with someone, the sentence is death. This is why when you hate somebody in your heart or you go out and commit genocide, the sentence is death. This is why whether you steal by downloading or jailbreaking devices or you steal billions from the government, the sentence is death. For ultimately, God, the true and righteous judge, sees us all as guilty of high treason every time we decide we want to determine for ourselves what's right and what's wrong and not follow His rule. All are guilty. Thus, in the original Passover event, the problem is when a holy God comes to Egypt, it's a disaster for everyone. Hence, the ending verse in the account of the Passover in Exodus chapter 12, verse 30, states, For there was not a house without someone dead. Death was the only way to deal with the wrath of a righteous God. So, so far, we have seen how there was a conspiracy to get Jesus killed, but it was still part of God's plan. We have seen how Jesus is actually innocent and how Barabbas is guilty. But the crux of the passage is the most shocking portion of the story. Look down at your Bibles in the passage again. You will see it again and again. A choice. Who goes free? Jesus the innocent or Barabbas the guilty? This starts in verse 17 when Pilate first presents the choice to the people. Whom do you want me to release for you? Barabbas or Jesus who is called Christ? But the Jewish leaders had already decided and they maneuvered the crowd to ensure that Jesus is sentenced to death. Again, in verse 21, Pilate tries again, which of the two do you want me to release to you? The crowd chooses to free Barabbas, and Pilate asks what he should do with Jesus, and when he heard crucify, Pilate makes a last-ditch attempt to get them to change their minds by asking in verse 23, why, what evil has this man done? But then he finally caves in, as we've seen earlier, to make his life easier in verse 26. Then he released for them Barabbas, having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Now we see that the gospel at its core ultimately is unfair. This trial is unfair. For we see that Jesus the innocent is punished and Barabbas the guilty go free. But this again is what happens at Passover. An innocent blameless lamb has to die in the place of the firstborn who would have rightly died. So here the Passover lamb of God is sacrificed so that Barabbas, a guilty son of father, may walk free. Here we have come to one of the great stumbling blocks that people find when they are considering the Christian faith. In technical terms, this is called the doctrine of substitutionary atonement, focusing on penal substitution. For those who wish a deeper dive, there is a brilliant book called Pierce for Our Transgressions, which I would highly recommend. For many people, pride gets in the way of letting someone else pay for them. It is difficult to accept God's mercy and grace that is freely given. When I was growing up, you know, when we had all these big meals between several families, there was always a brawl at the end of the meal where everybody's fighting to pay the bill. But that's just a minor example of this pride. I once shared my faith with a very close non-Christian friend, and in response he said to me, when I die, if I've made mistakes... I'll pay for my own mistakes. And like Judas, he will. The declaration by the Jewish leaders in verse 25, his blood be on us and on our children, is also shocking, but it's an extension of that idea of paying for their own mistakes. In their drive to ensure that Jesus gets killed, they go out and make it easier for Pilate to hand over Jesus by trying to accept full responsibility for it but in the same breath, they're calling a curse on themselves and their children. But this is bad theology. 
Old, Test Old Testament law makes it clear they alone are responsible for their evil and not their children. But even here, God's plan is at work as well. If there was to be any hope for salvation for them and their children, they had to have Jesus' blood upon them. In the same way, during Passover, that when the blood was on the doorpost of the house, God would pass over the house and not enter and kill the firstborn, so it is now. It is only when God, God sees the blood of Jesus on us that judgment would pass over us and we will not be sentenced to death for our sin. But this then becomes a double-edged sword. For believers, having Jesus' blood on us is a mark of our salvation. It is a mark for unbelievers, it is a mark of judgment for killing the Son of God. And so we see how God's purposes are still worked out even though mankind was going about carrying out their evil plans. At my old church in London, a similar warning was given before communion that to those who believe partaking in the bread and the wine would bring salvation. To those who do not believe, Partaking in the bread and the wine brings upon judgment. So let me wrap this up and tie everything together. We so often look at just the events of this, and it looks like in the event that everything is careening out of control, but yet here, even here where the hour that darkness reigns, when we look at the details, we can still see that God is in charge. The selfishness of both the Jewish leaders and Pilate are used by God to accomplish his goals of having his Passover lamb sacrificed for the sins of the guilty. During the events of Passover, God comes to Egypt. When God comes, sin is judged and the payment is death. The choice was either you paid for yourselves with the firstborn dying or la innocent lamb was killed and blood placed, placed on the door so that God will see it and pass over. In our passage today, we have seen the Passover lamb of God being declared innocent by Pilate, sentenced to die in the place of the guilty son or father. The innocence dies, the guilty go free. This is deeply unfair. The trial is unfair. The gospel is unfair. The choice is done to us whether to accept that Jesus, the innocent, will die for us with his blood upon us, or we will die for our own mistakes ourselves. To those who can accept Jesus the innocent taking your place to die, how then should we respond? For some disbelief, others awe, others gratefulness, others sadness, and others joy. Now I would like to ask for you to take some time to reflect on what you've heard. I've chosen to, for a song to be played during this time. Uh, the lyrics are very appropriate for it. It's an old hymn by Charles Wesley called And Can It Be. It's been set to modern music by Nathan Fallingham of a British worship band called Fat Fish. I'll close in prayer after the song ends.
Right. Let me close us in prayer. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain, for me who him to death pursued. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Lord, we, it is amazing and it's deep and so wondrous that you have sent your son to die for us, that we are as like all are like Barabbas and we were guilty and we should have died. But Jesus, the innocent, takes our place. Lord, help us to just be more grateful for it, be more touched by it. Help us see that there is no bragging left in, Christ, in Christianity because all we bring to, to this is just our sins. And that it is all because of Jesus' sacrifice that we walk free. May we love you more. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.